Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales, Tales from, from Outer, Outer Space. Space. Hope you enjoy. Little Bird Buddy, Jimmy, Agent 007. Nothing quite wakes you up from a bad dream like a human kicking down your door in his underwear while brandishing a wrench that weighs more than you. I could see his predatory eyes searching the room for a target before finally settling on me once he was sure nothing else was in the room. Are you right? I heard screaming. The intensity in his voice was palpable. I'm okay. I hopped out of bed, the nest pouch hanging on the wall, and stretched my wings. I just had bothersome thoughts while asleep. I'm sorry if they woke you. Sometimes you must study humans for a long time to pick up on the subtle shifts in their demeanor. This was not one of those times. As the tense body language ready for action softened into an almost delicate grace, he leaned the door back on its frame before nearly sitting on one of my chairs, remembering the door wasn't the only thing not built for humans and stopped. Don't apologize for your nightmares, my little bird buddy. The deep, soothing voice was almost enough to put me back to sleep. Tell me what's wrong. Humans don't usually have nightmares unless something is really bothering us. My son is in the hospital. He needs a transfusion, and I'm the only compatible donor. A treatment we learned from human doctors, as it was explained to me. But the next transport isn't for another week. It was hard to say out loud. The warrior felt almost choking the words. Seeing such concern and alien eyes for a life so disconnected from him was strange. Will he be able to hold on until then? Doctors say it's possible. My voice told him that just how bad the odds were. The problem is, uh, the government office said that they can't send an unscheduled transport for a medical emergency if it's not for someone at the outpost. I already tried calling to get them to make an exception. I pointed my beak in the direction of the comms unit. Those stupid pieces of... He almost choked himself with anger before stopping and going to the comms. I didn't see how he would get anywhere with them, but I wasn't going to try and stop him. Humans had a way of doing things different and getting results. This is Manny O'Malley. I need an emergency transport sent to Mining Outpost 457. Send it immediately. His blunt order took the operator by surprise, but they soon recovered. I checked your comms unit code. We are aware of the emergency you're referring to, but the government procedure hasn't changed. We can only dispatch emergency transports to a location of the emergency. The operator jumped back in annoyance. Manny sighed with a heavy breath. Then he took a deep breath. Listen here. Either you send us a transport or you can schedule one for yourself. Because if anything happens to that boy, I am going to hunt you down and pluck you bald. Then deep fry you in 15 different secret spices and feast on your carcass in front of your co-workers until... The line was cut and the operator squawked in fear and hit the button. I never wanted to know what else would have been said had the conversation continued. I uh, overdid it. Manny grunted in disappointment. It was worth a try. I would have let out a long, sad whistle had Manny not whipped his head around at me to glare into my soul. We're not done yet. Get your bag off the wall. Meet me in the landing pad. He stood up and shoved the door aside to let in the first rays of daylight. You'll get your ride. I wondered what he had planned. Humans were known to be quite adept at building vehicles from scrap. But something that could fly to the city would probably have taken until the regular transport arrived to build. I'd never find out. When I got to the landing pad, I saw Manny dressed in work clothes. He was wearing a tool harness covered in pouches hanging from his chest. On the ground was the back harness for mining equipment, but the mining equipment's gone, leaving only the metal frame. What is going on? I asked, as he pushed bottles into holsters in his rigging. The warning labels in every language, but human one explaining how toxic it was. Getting my emergency drinks ready. Manny took my pocket nest and attached it to the rig. Get in. I did as instructed, and then I hoisted up into his back. I wondered if we were going to jump on a passing transport or something. Take this. He handed me a navigational display. Humans tend to veer off course over long distances. The display was set to the beacon of the main colony. Wait, what? Hold on, little bird buddy. I've got this. Manny shouted as he started to move forwards. The pace kept increasing as I bounced in the nest on his back. And suddenly, the plan dawned on me. He was going to run. Run a distance that you would need a satellite to track. 
We left the landing area and were off to the mining area. As we got close to the edge of the pit, I was puzzled as to why we weren't diverting to the ramp. Then I became terrified a moment before he leapt over the edge. Even with the lower gravity, I was sure he couldn't make the jump and was technically correct. He landed on one of the cranes that weren't visible from the outside, and I noticed all the cranes were lined up, connecting us in the far side of the pit. While I held on for dear life and bounded from crane to crane, Manny waved at all of those crane controls as we passed. How did you get everyone awake and into the mines in so little time? I asked once we had finished crossing the other side and were running along the open grasslands. I may have mentioned something about a secret spices, he chuckled to himself. He was right about needing to be corrected as he ran. There was a subtle shift towards this dominant side that I corrected every so often as I bounced in my nest on the back while clutching the device. We didn't stop when he wanted to eat or drink. He just ate the meal bar while running and followed up with a long drawer of one of the bottles he kept. When I mentioned that I would need something, he opened more pouches to give me what I needed. I was eating a bag of freeze-dried blueberries when he spoke up. Ah, the trees, finally! His pace quickened a bit. I couldn't see them, not for a while at any rate, but his course didn't need correction once he had a fixed point to focus on. Of course, it wasn't the trees of the colony city as they finally came into my view. That's the wild jungle they planted years ago. It's overgrown and uncivilized. I realized he wasn't changing direction. We're going through it, aren't we? That could be an Amazon rainforest and it wouldn't stop me. Before or after we regrew it, nothing in there I need to be worried about. I suspected he might be right, given it was only dangerous by my standards, and humans tend to enjoy things even though they consider them hazardous. Generally, my people don't do much more than glide short distances, having traded long-distance flight for intelligence long ago in our evolutionary ladder. I had flown between trees before, though. It was a good exercise and sharpened your reactions. On the other hand, Manny bounded between the trees with a speed I couldn't have been able to match. As the brush thickened, I got concerned. Our lines might be rather strong, even by your standards. Try not to get caught up in any. I halted as I saw him running right into one that was suddenly separated in a flash of metal. You were saying... Nanny brandished a massive flat blade as long as I was and continued to slice through anything that got in our way. Thank the ancient deities of our world, you humans got over your warring face before first contact. I commented in between continued corrections on our heading. You and me both. We are making way more friends this way. But you better believe we haven't forgotten how to fight if some race comes along looking for a fight. He sheathed the blade as we arrived at the river. I knew the dangers that lurked in the water. They would be from our home world, and half the reason our species evolved fight was to keep away from them. I kept my mind off that thought, hoping they hadn't yet been seeded onto the world like the Kotak swarms, I asked as he lifted my nest and me off his back to hold over his head as he forded the river. Ah, they were nice enough today and once you talked to the Hive Queen instead of the drones. He wouldn't believe how sorry they were once they realized non-Hive species were intelligent. That was the last thing he said before his head went under the water. He was still walking along, so I tried not to get worried, but I knew humans couldn't breathe underwater. When he did emerge, he kept talking like nothing happened. We were the only ones who could get through to them because of how humans can coordinate things. They saw a pattern in how our ships and fighters moved. He looked down at himself and made an interested noise. I looked down and saw a number of aquatic predators that I'd feared clung onto the human's exposed flesh. You know that you are being attacked, right? Am I? He countered as he kept walking. I looked again. And while there were red marks and attempts had been made, everything that had been trying to bite him had failed. They fell off as he left the water, and they couldn't survive without letting go. Oh, I remarked. Critters, he rebuked dismissively. I decided I never wanted to go to Earth. I didn't even need to read a book about what kinds of animals lived on it. I, if I ever did, the nightmares would never stop. I watched as we left behind the most dangerous creatures our world had, writhing on the ground because they couldn't even hurt a human. We pushed through the jungle until I suddenly ended a few dozen meters from a cliff face. It looked like an almost vertical incline. 
I wondered if he had taken time to check the elevation map before he left. What's that? I asked, distracted from asking if he knew what way was the shortest around. Magnesium carbonate, he stated flatly as he dusted the powder over his hands, as if that was the only explanation I needed. Before I could ask my original question, he moved up to the bare rock and started climbing. I looked up the two dozen meters we would have to climb and balked at the idea that the heavy human could ascend directly even in lower gravity. You think you can climb this? I asked. It's not even totally vertical, let alone an overhang. I'll be fine. Then his response seemed to be like he found the question amusingly silly. Should I try flapping my wings? I thought he needed my help. Yeah, that would make it a bit more challenging. Go for it. Such insanity shouldn't have surprised me coming from a race that invented flight before remote controls. But it always did. I stayed still as we quickly made our way up and over the cliff's edge, where we could see the setting sun go down over the horizon. I was exhausted. Should we rest for the night? I asked, seeing that Manny was taking a moment to catch his breath. You can go ahead and sleep. He chugged an entire bottle in one go. I'm a hair under the toxic dose of the good stuff. I'll be fine all night. I didn't want to know what he drank. Whatever it was, reading the warning label alone would have probably killed me. He took a navigation device from me and let me crawl into my nest and get what sleep I could. It wasn't easy doing so on the back of the human, but I managed. When I woke, Manny was still running. Poking my head out of the nest, I could see the city in the dawn light. We made it, I exclaimed, so full of excitement. You betcha, little bird buddy. He seemed to pick up his pace as we approached the forest. All our facilities will be in the trees. We need to get up there. But moving around will be difficult since we don't have a vehicle and you don't have wings, I explained as we approached the outskirts. Elevator, right there. It'll get us up there. He ran into the open doors and slammed his fist onto the button. I was grateful the equipment was rated for human use and started moving us up. Manny detached most of his gear except for my nest on his back and left it on the floor. Then he pulled out a small tube and examined it. What is that? I was curious and excited to be so close to our call. It is something that has a warning label written in human, he smiled. It's going to get us over the finish line. No, I can't let you put your life in danger. It frightened me they would risk themselves so casually. Relax, his warning says it's only dangerous if I make a habit of it. Or have a heart condition. Besides, we are literally on our way to a hospital. It's a multi-species, right? Yes, but... Then relax, I'll be fine. He slammed the tube into the side of his neck, and his whole body shook before settling down again. He burst out of the door with new energy, and we found ourselves at the city level, but no vehicles were parked in the lot. We could see the direction we needed to go, but with trees, branches, and vines in the way. Well, uh, this is going to be interesting. He tensed up like he was getting ready to jump from branch to branch, but they were too far apart, and the colony infrastructure was still being built. Do I need to remind you that humans did not evolve from birds? I asked, wondering if the injection he took impaired his judgment. He turned to look at me in the eyes with either a manic insanity or a childlike glee. No, we evolved from monkeys. I didn't have time to ask what a monkey was as he bolted forward and leapt from the platform. The only thing close to us was a vine hanging from the trees, and I had to conclude monkeys evolved through brute force stupidity. Manny grabbed onto the vine and swung, using our momentum to the next vine and the next. Occasionally, we landed on a branch to adjust our course, but only briefly, before leaping onto another vine. The entire time, he pillowed a strange primal holler. I didn't even realize that we were here at the hospital until we rode the vine to crash through the front door. We're here. Quick, find out where we are going. Manny brought me to the clerk, who quickly told us where my family was after I explained that we weren't there to attack the place. Manny seemed more comfortable in a structure laid out for most races to get around in, and bounded up the stairs faster than the internal elevator could take us, skipping most of them. We got to the floor where my family was, and we were soon bursting through the door. There, in the medical nest, was my son and wife comforting him. Their expressions looked a lot like mine, probably did, when Manny burst through my door. I leapt onto his shoulder before gliding down to be with my family. You! Manny pointed at the doctor, who had been in the room checking on his patient. Transfusion! Now! The doctor got to work without any need to mention a secret spices. 
and I was soon hooked up to allow my blood to flow to my son. Satisfied that everything that needed to be done had been done, Manny collapsed on a chair that thankfully supported his weight. I heard a new man burst in here. Is everything okay? Came a new voice. I noticed another human came in, a doctor according to the card pinned to her coat. Only this one was smaller than Manny, with long red hair and a differently shaped chest. It reminded him of the pictures Manny had in his locker, only with clothing. Manny reacted to the sound of the voice like he had taken another stimulant. Shut up to his feet. Just fine, doctor. Had to give my little bird buddy a ride. Did you take a stimulant? She examined his neck, where the injection mark was unmistakable, before looking at the attempted bite marks and the rest of him. Just a few energy drinks and electrolytes and such, then a dose of um, a party favor. Have you fine, though? Manny didn't quite look fine, even from my perspective, but the doctor looked interested rather than he concerned. He ran all day and night just to get me here in time to save my son's life, waded through an infested river and fought off the predators that would have killed me, climbed up a vertical cliff face and swung us the rest of the way using the vines. It was hard to muster the energy to convey enthusiasm with my blood being drained, but the doctor's eyes widened at my story. That's amazing. Are you sure you're all right? I could check you in the room next to your friend here. The doctor seemed genuinely impressed. Well, you look like you were on your way home. He gestured to a coat in her arms. I don't want to keep you after a long day of work when I'm just fine. But if you insist, don't be silly, Manny, I interjected, hoping that I read the right signals. I'm sure the doctor can monitor your health at her place. No need for paperwork or medical bills. Both humans turned their eyes to me for a moment before turning to each other. I can certainly keep on top of your condition from the comfort of a human bed. The human said with a subtext I wasn't familiar with, but could take a guess. I always follow doctor's orders, Manny replied with a happy grin. The doctor turned to leave and Manny turned to face me, sticking his arm out with a closed fist except that it was extended thumb. You are the best wingman, my little bird buddy. Manny left the room and my wife finally spoke. What just happened? I think I just secured him a mate. End of story. I would quickly like to thank the T5 channel members and Patreons. Casper Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, Barky, Lord Azrakal, It's Difficult to Pronounce, Dragzoon, WRE, Holly's Sister, Arcadian. Thank you very much.